Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Since the fall of mankind, death has been an unavoidable element faced by each man and woman who walks this planet. For some, this subject is the source of great anxiety, while others accept this to be a natural part of life. For those with a religious belief system, conviction therein plays a role in uh, what a person feels can be anticipated when this life is concluded. But what does the Bible say on this matter? How does one reconcile such elements as near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences to his or her religious views? Is there really an afterlife or do we cease to exist when we die? Donna Howell is a teacher, prophet, licensed minister, editor, and has a powerful voice in the Christian world. Her book, Radicals, Why Tomorrow Belongs to Post-Denominational Christians Infused with Supernatural Power, speaks of how we, as followers of Christ, are radicals for God when we truly follow His voice. She's also co-written several books with Tom Horn, publications such as Redeemed, Unredeemable, How Eternal Salvation is Available to Everyone, and Final Fire is the Next Great Awakening right around the corner. Ali Anderson Henson serves as an administrator of Skywatch TV and Defender Publishing and Whispering Ponies Ranch. As a researcher and writer, her most recent work has appeared in Unearthing the Lost World of the Cloud Eaters by Tom Horn and Steve Quayle, On the Path of the Immortals by Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, When Once We Were a Nation, How to Overcome the Most Frightening Issues You Will Face This Century, and more. They, along with Josh Peck, co-authored Afterlife, Near-Death Experiences, Neuroscience, Quantum Physics, and the Increasing Evidence for Life After Death. Joining us now for part two of a two-hour special are co-authors of Afterlife, Donna Howell and Allie Anderson, Anderson Henson. Allie and Donna, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. Good to see you both. How are you? Good. Thank, thank you. you, Eric. Good to see you having us. Yep, it's, uh, I've interviewed you both separately, but I don't believe I've had you both on together. And uh, this is kind of like the uh, trifecta of uh, great researchers who are really committed to biblical truth in light of scientific evidence and finding the balance. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Tom Horn has put together some of the greatest biblical and scientific researchers under one roof of any organization that I know. Derek Gilbert and Sharon are both considered, in my opinion, to be two extraordinary researchers, and you are right there in the same league as them and Josh, and now Drew has joined the team, and so it's quite, quite a, a, a kind of an ominous group of uh, really brilliant minds converging together to tackle a subject that the church talks nothing about. It's all about avoiding hell. It's all about eternal life, but no discussion whatsoever of either one of those into any depth. It's just, you know, get your ticket out. Uh, make sure that it's punched on the right side of the ticket so you can get into heaven. And that's really the extent of it. Uh, Josh kind of shared that you guys are all friends and your families are, are all close together. And you're a very close-knit, uh, collegial kind of group, uh, peers and friends, and uh, the subject came up and you decided to dive into pursuing it. How did you approach who was going to do what? Where were your passions in this? Donna, let me start with you. What was your passion in this? Okay, so let's talk about the afterlife. Let's talk about near-death experiences. Let's talk about neuroscience. Let's talk about quantum physics. Let's even throw quantum faith in there. And then let's talk about evidence for life after death. And so, boom, Donna, you speak up and you say, well, hey, I'll take what? Uh, well, what happened was Josh was, um, Josh and I were having um, a, one of our Chalk Talk episodes where we were discussing after the cameras had gone off uh, that he has dreamed of writing a book about the transition into afterlife, the different, um, not only, you know, metaphysical and scientific, uh, realities that we've studied, um, but also just what, you know, what happens between I'm alive and now I'm with Jesus. And he was so fascinated by that. And he said that he wanted to write something that nobody else had written and really hit the hard hitting questions that the church won't touch and science can't answer. And, um, 
be able to offer to our, our generations of our age and younger that are just driven by this intellectual hunger that won't be satisfied by Xerox theology or mom and dad taught me so I believe kind of uh, religion and, and, and answer everything. So we got to talking and, and I said, you know, I don't know much about the, the metaphysical understanding of science and NDEs. That's really more his expertise. But what fascinates me is the Shroud of Turin. And how many people in the church just go, oh, you know, they think they know like everything there is to know about that, or they think it's a Catholic thing, or they think, you know, it doesn't apply, or they do what's worse, which is to just say that it's it's a forgery, which is like, no. <laughs> so we got to talking about what he knew about the afterlife and what I knew about the shroud. And then between the two of us, we had intended on writing a specific kind of book. And then shortly, I'm sure he's probably gone into this on his testimony with you, but shortly into the writing of this, they got the info, um, the notice that Nathan was uh, diagnosed with cancer, his son. Right. So they had to go to Memphis there for a while, and we brought in Allie to kind of help smooth the edges. And Allie ended up being kind of like, you know, like the hidden ingredient that married all of these things together. And she 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 has this ability to to kind of take this mess that was left with me and Josh where we were like, oh shoot, the book is midway and we don't, you know, we don't have any way of doing this together. And so she really helped glue it all together. That's just how the book came together. Allie, when you heard, um, of course, we we um, are supporters of Josh and, and Nathan in, in this battle um, and helping with the medical expenses. And we will encourage our audience to follow Josh Peck in the journey with his son. Uh, as as um, we continue to pray for them, Ali, when you heard that this was going on, and and you had uh, kind of come in to sew it up together, to suture it back in in into place, uh, there's a part in here that uh, you have a great contribution to that had to deal with the soul and had to deal with the heart of God and had to deal with some other things that were inserted in the equation that all of a sudden took this from a research document into a true biblical truth journey that, that touched on the true nature of God and the heart of God and then got into things like the weight of the soul and um, how, how did all this come together for you? Well, um, it as as Donna kind of mentioned, you know, it was kind of a crazy time. They had started this book together, and I'm trying to remember what I was finishing up at the time, but I, I, had, I was just finishing up another book, and we found out that um, Josh would be leaving very suddenly to go and take Nathan for treatment, and it became, as she mentioned, you know, just me kind of coming in and sort of trying to patch things up and kind of help get Josh's stuff and smooth out some transitional things and one of the first things they had said when they were kind of telling me the content of the book was that they wanted to tackle some of the tough questions. Um, I'm sorry to say that there are a lot of times that the church does not tackle the tough questions and it kind of becomes this thing where if it's theologically ambiguous then a lot of people shy away from it and like you said you know they stay to get your ticket out of hell make sure you get that you know and there's so much about there are some really tough questions out there and there are people who are really hurting and they're not getting touchy happy feel-good answers they they're faced with these really complicated life situations and um they're they're looking for answers in the church sometimes um is ill-equipped to answer those questions and so when it was I'm looking at, you know, her very, you know, deep historical accounting of the shroud and things like that. And I'm looking at Josh's, you know, very scientific point of view. And uh, it just kind of was like, if we're going to ask these tough questions and we're really going to tackle them, then let's do this thing. And I was taking <laughs> some really amazing Bible classes at the time. And, um, and I was reading some books that were just really um, very illuminating on a lot of things that are tough subjects that people kind of don't get into and it seemed it, I really believe that God brought it together because here I am doing this work and reading these books for school which I'm I'm in school and 
I probably will be till I die, um, just because I love it. But um, anyway, so so I'm taking these classes, and as every time I came to a place where I'm thinking, if I'm a reader, and especially if I'm not a Bible believing Christian, and I've taken a chance to read this book, the next question I'm going to have is, hold on, if God is so loving, then why this or that? And then the minute that I would have that question. You know, somewhere in the reading that it, for this class I was in, it was addressed. And so it was just, I just really believed, um, you know, that God had brought these questions into my mind and at the same time kind of said, here's some, here's some, you know, uh, information on that. And we were able to kind of explore that because ultimately we can write all the books and we can say all these really wonderful and inspirational things, but if we're not changing people's lives and if we're not reaching them for God, and if we're not showing them that God truly loves us, that we're here because he loves us and because he's trying to show his love for us every day, even when we can't see it in the works of what's happening in the world. Um, if we're not conveying that message, then it's kind of all fluffy. And so we just all agreed to delve in and it became i think a bigger you know work than any one of us would have really thought to tackle on our own but i'm grateful that i was part of it it was an honor honestly all right and and if i could add to what she's just said real quick i'll say that there's a harmony between science and religion that i haven't seen on any other work like this I mean, there tends to be, in every religious book, it's, well, here's what our theology believes. Here's our little fundamental statement of faith that may or may not even apply to any secular reader out there. And then every scientific book on the subject is no respecter of religion. So there was kind of this conundrum from the beginning. How do we create a harmony between religion, science, metaphysics, and psychology that addresses this from a way that it either can harmonize or here's the reasons why it can't harmonize and here's why our faith needs to either be this you know insurmountable obstacle over here no it doesn't because here's this other angle so we did something that i hadn't seen any other book on the subject do and that is to 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 to, to say what the church won't say which is here's what science says and here's how theology either does or does not agree with and harmonize with that and here's where we should be as believers in our step of faith regarding the subject of the afterlife wow the um, whole concept of the book uh, was just stunning to me um, Ali The heart stops, the brain continues to be active. Some say up to 10 minutes after the heart stops. What's happening in the brain? What's, what's going on? Why are there synapses firing? What, what's happening and what's going on within the person themselves? Do we have any idea? Are we able to uh, look at patterns of EEGs and find some connection between them? Are they random spikes? Are they patterned? Are they, uh, do they replicate thought? W what do we see in those? Well, um, we actually did cover some research that was done by Dr. Sam Parnia at a uh, at a prestigious university, and um, you know he had he had said what you're saying that the brain does stay active for a while after the heart stops, and so it was fascinating to read about. I'm not a doctor, so for me to explain, you know, on a physical level what exactly is taking place, I think that um, I think that doctors are still trying to kind of answer that question. If if they had all the scientific answers to that question, um, there would be a lot less. Um, misinformation out there about what is taking place during that period of time. But we know from out-of-body experiences and from near-death experiences that there is, uh, you know, phenomena that is um, not just explainable by, you know, oh, you were unconscious and you had a crazy dream and you think you were just having a near-death experience. That's not the case because these people have out-of-body experiences and they're able to come back and explain things that took place around them that they literally had to be observing from outside their body. Um, and we've got a few cases of that in the book. So one example is a lady who had kind of um, ascended out of her body and she was able to see in a hospital outside the building where there was 
up very high, there was a shoe on a windowsill. Um, and uh, another example of this is um, Bruce Vanatta, when a Peterbilt logging truck pretty much cut him in half, and he had a near-death experience and an out-of-body experience. And I'm not sure if you and Josh went over the difference between the two, but near-death is when you literally are near-death and, and your soul is probably very close to leaving your body. Um, but an out-of-body experience is actually when you see from a point of view outside of your body. And so there is a slight difference and there are different types of um, different types of trait events that take place in each of these. So there is a differentiation between the two. But people who can who can describe like Bruce Benatta, he knew that um, emergency responders had used a different door that some of them had used a different door than everybody else had come through when his emergency happened. And that was actually one of the ways that they later validated that he didn't have some crazy dream that two angels were actually holding him together while he laid there cut in half by a Peterbilt logging truck. You know, these angels were holding his body together is something we also discuss in our book Encounters. But, um, you know, when, when this story came under question, he was able to say that the two the two last paramedics who arrived came in through the back door. Well, the only way to know that would be to be watching um, from outside his body, which he was. So um, we know that there are things like that that go on. And then, you know, you had mentioned this um, situation in 1907 with Dr. Duncan McDougall. Um, and there's, it's really, uh, it's very cute. It's on page, um, page seven of the book. I don't know. I'll, I'll hold this up. Don't know if you can see it. Um, but it's the uh, the New York Times actual, the story on March 10th of 1907, New York Times. You actually still can look that story up. It's, it's in the New York Times, that old story. But um, basically, he had gone through a series of experiments, and uh, he had six or seven dying patients who agreed to lay on a hanging scale during their final moments. And so their final period of life was spent hanging on these um, on these hanging scales and there are two 28.34 grams in an ounce and patients each as they died um, lost between a half ounce and a full ounce which he averaged to be 21 grams so this is where the the you can call it the belief or the myth um, it's really uh, they've never confirmed it one way or another in the medical world but this is where the belief that the soul weighs three-fourths of an ounce comes from. And so, you know, he, he did this. He had one run of these initial uh, patients who were willing to go through this. And then his ethics were challenged because there were people who thought, well, that's just a terrible way to let somebody experience their final, you know, moments on earth hanging on this scale. And so they kind of they kind of shut that practice down. And after that, he went on to try to photograph the soul. And he was never um, he was never successful at that. But he, he conducted this experiment and he made some interesting observations. So, for example, one man who uh, who had more of a kind of a, a slow to act type of personality, this particular man, um, his his three fourths of an ounce that he lost happened a little more slowly, whereas those who had more kind of assertive and competent personalities, they lost this weight more quickly. Um, and then there are other people within the medical world who say, well, that's just dehydration or that's just, you know, other stuff within the body shifting. And we do actually kind of address each of those arguments. And at the end of the day, you know, I guess I guess until the medical world really scientifically proves uh, one of those theories to be the exact one, uh, they're just all for the reader to decide. And I'll say that that's another thing we've done in this book. There are a few times where we don't know and we just give some say this, some say this, the reader can decide. Uh, if we don't know something, I think it's pretty important uh, as a Bible-believing Christian that if you don't know the answer to something, you just be honest about that and don't try to bluff your way through it. Um, I think that's a stronger witness. And so there are a few times in here where we literally just explain what the various arguments are and let the reader kind of see which one they subscribe to. <laughs> Well, I think it was very, very, very balanced, both in <clears throat> in uh, the Shroud of Turin section was very balanced uh, in saying, being right up front and saying, we are not, we can argue this both ways. And it's, to, to me, it's it's like 
uh, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, all that. I can argue every one of them, uh, and you can have 20% believe this, 20% believe this, 20% believe this, 20%. Well, all that tells me is 80% of people are wrong. That's what that tells me. Statistic. <laughs> That's the only thing I can garner from all the different opinions of that. So we'll all find out at the same time, and there's things in here that we will all discover at the same time, and that is upon death will we find the ultimate answers. But there's two aspects to this, and uh, uh, I want to kind of take uh, with, with Ali and pursue this. We've come with this concept of, uh, and if this was your area, of heaven and hell and Abraham's bosom and uh, Sheol as we look at the righteous side of, uh, of, of hell uh, where the righteous souls are waiting to be reunited and resurrected with their bodies. Uh, and then there's the a punishment side of hell, which is the lake of fire. And so this is the ancient Jewish belief into where <clears throat> uh, the soul goes. Most people don't ever talk. We talk about to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's a spirit. From dust to the earth you are made, dust to the earth you return. That's flesh. The soul is not addressed in the narrative. Nobody tells you where your soul goes in this equation of death. So if we are created in the image of God, and uh, that's two parts invisible, one part visible, we can't see the Father, we can't see the Holy Spirit, but we can see the Son. I can't see your soul, I can't see your spirit, but I can see your flesh. So forensically created in the image of God, two parts invisible, one part visible. What happens to our soul upon death? Well, um, it is appointed to man to die and then the judgment. So, you know, back before Jesus was crucified, um, you know, the, the soul went to Abraham's bosom where it was, where it was kept uh, until Jesus made that sacrifice. Um, and what people tend to get hung up on is the fact that, um, that salvation is a transaction. And so we get a lot of people, and it's a witness stopper. It stops people from being able to really, you know, um, embrace God because they think, well, if God is such a loving God, why does he allow people to go to hell? You know, but before Jesus made that sacrifice, um, you know, there were the, the righteous went to purgatory. But now we have this we have this free straight into heaven that we have been given license to because of the sacrifice that he made. And, um, and so that's, that's what takes place now. So is that the spirit and the soul united together that are going into heaven? And then they were, when we return uh, to rule and reign, all right, depending on when you think you may still be here, you may return with him, it all depends on what your theology is. Uh, is the soul, mind, will, and emotions restored to the resurrected body where the spirit also reunites? And we see this happen. See, it's not talked about in the church, but at the crucifixion, when Jesus spoke the words, it is finished, everybody talks about the veil was rent in two. But there was an earthquake, and in that earthquake, the graves of the righteous saints, the Jewish saints, were opened, and they were resurrected, and they were seen walking the streets, and they were recognized. You don't hear this preaching. Sign up on the church sign. This week, Sunday sermon is the resurrected Jewish saints on the day of crucifixion. Just not talked about. But God includes it in there to tell us that this, it, this has happened, this will happen, and we should understand that it will be recognizable when it happens. This was the reason why it said, and they recognized them. We have over 500, and we know that they were, rec who were they, that they would recognize them. This is the interesting part. Now, <clears throat> we've met before, so I would recognize you. Right? If I ran into you uh, and I was traveling, I would see you in passing and say, boy, you sure look familiar. Oh, Don Donna Howell, right? Yeah, okay. But if we were, 500 years apart. Maybe it was Zechariah. 
Maybe it was Isaiah. Maybe it was Abraham, and even 2,000 years prior. Maybe it was Moses. Uh, you know, we're talking about almost two, 3,000 year period. How were they recognized? There had to be attributes that were recognizable attributes. And so this is one of those ponderables because there is no expository. God doesn't tell you anything more about it than just telling you it happened. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the big question marks. One of the things I like about Spanish is there's a question mark at the beginning, there's a question mark at the end. Okay. Uh, I really like that. I think that there are questions like this one that need a question mark at the beginning. Okay. This is an important question and a question mark at the end that says this is a question that may not be able to be answered. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do we explain this God who gives us a choice and we all are given that choice is that, just postulating here, is that the potential for the activity that's going on in the brain after the body ceases to exist, that God meets the individual at that time and almost, not a Monty Hall, let me show you what's behind door number one, let's make a deal, let me show you what's behind door number two. Is it a second chance? Is this how Jewish people, 44 years, the first 44 years of my life, I never heard about Jesus except to sing Christmas carols. Okay? He was the God of the Gentiles. This was somebody that had nothing to do with the Jews. Uh, I found out Jesus was Jewish when I was 44. I was like, how come nobody told me that? Well, who was going to tell me that? My Jewish mother, my Jewish father, my rabbis? Why would they be discussing Jesus with me? So had I died before that point, how would I have knowledge of the gospel message if I never heard the gospel message? And if God devises 2 Samuel 14, 14, it says like water falls to the ground and does not return, we all must die, but God does not desire that. He devises ways for those who are estranged from him to return. So he must have a way because he says he devises ways. He must have a way to meet me where I am. Maybe is it in this death experience? That's a theologically loaded question. And we discuss some of that in the book. Um, I will say I, my, my response to that goes kind of two directions. So bear with me for just a moment. I think that the first response I have to that is in that moment when that mass resurrection took place, my personal belief is that um, this was kind of to say, you know, these souls are being moved from Abraham's bosom and into heaven. Okay. And so for those who right now are saying, it's okay, um, you know, so-and-so, grandma or my friend or whoever, if you die, we'll just do all these things here to get you out of purgatory and move you forward. There, there, that's not happening. You know, those souls, that purgatory period of time was before Jesus died, Abraham's bosom, whatever terminology you want to use. But I believe that that was kind of very briefly included there so that people would understand that that period of time has passed. And even then, I don't believe that back in that day, a person could make penance for someone else who was in Abraham's bosom. So I guess I should be real careful about saying it's always the individual. It's it's not somebody else doing it for right. you. But I, I believe that brief statement is in the Bible so that people in modern religions who believe they can do things to move their dead loved ones, you know, from purgatory or Abraham's bosom into heaven, that that's that time, even if it had worked that way, that time is over. Um, as for recognizable attributes, um, you know, we, we see such a narrow, just in general, we see such a narrow picture. Our entire view is so narrow. And, um, you know, I, I often refer to the scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, I see through a glass darkly, but then will I know even as I am known. There is so much in this life we're not going to know. And if we knew, we would manipulate it. If I knew the exact date of my death, I would be tempted to just do anything I want right now and then just be like, well, the day before, I'll just ask God to forgive me, you know? And I think we have to be really careful with the concept, like what you're saying about 
a person who, you know, who, who we would maybe pronounce as dead and maybe their brain is still active for 10 minutes, but all the physical signs are gone and there's this period in between. Um, I love the idea that maybe in that moment, a person may meet God and have a second chance. We have to wonder about these people you know, and this is, again, a very loaded question. We have to wonder about these people who are, you know, in other countries who only ever live in a a tribe that worships some God that's not our biblical God. You know, if they they were truly, this is a a real question that lots of, you know, non-Bible believing people have. If that person really truly followed their God, their entire life, and they were devout to that God, well then what about that person's soul? I, so that little, you know, 10 minute period where their mind is still active, I love the idea that maybe God has devised a way to meet them and give them a chance. And yet, and I really want to be very, very, very blunt about this warning. If you're counting on that happening to you and you've already heard about Jesus, you've already heard the Bible, God already devised a way to get to you. You've heard it already. Right. So you can't say, oh, I'll just apologize to God in that 10 minute transition between the time my heart stops and the time my soul, you, we're not guaranteed that that's going to happen. There's there's nothing in the Bible to suggest that we're going to, like you, you mentioned, you know, the let's make a deal where you're going to get to kind of see behind the doors. I believe God's mercy is greater than we ever can understand in this lifetime. Yeah, yeah. But if you've rejected Jesus in this lifetime, you know, you have to understand that Matthew 10, 32 says, if we do not accept Jesus in this lifetime, he cannot accept us in the next. And um, and it's just really important that, you know, may, I, I believe God's grace is stronger than we know, but we just can't count on it. We cannot reject him and expect to get this grand, let's make a deal moment in between life and death. You know, when I heard the gospel for the first time, I I accepted the gospel for the first time. When I heard the plan of salvation, and it was the Lamb of God from Genesis 22, the Lamb of God from Exodus 12, and before the New Testament was written, John the Immerser, Yochanan the Mikvah man, uh, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so the concept of taking a sin away is a very foreign concept to a Jew because the only time that ever happened was the Day of Atonement. You couldn't, uh, when the scapegoat took the unintentional national sin of Israel. But your personal sin was never, it was always covered, it was never taken away. This was such a profound concept to me that it revealed to me the heart of God that he wanted to take my sin away. He didn't want me to live in this, 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 this pit of, of despair and filth and, and, and wanted to cleanse me and to change my clothes with a robe of righteousness and exchange my clothing for a garment of salvation and redress me like he redressed Adam and Eve, that I got to be redressed and reclothed like that. Uh, It it, it speaks to the heart of God, and and anyone who hears this, don't count on that. Uh, You know, my hope is, is my father who never heard the gospel, who passed away. My hope is is that, that I, I believe in the mercy and, and, and the love of God and that I hope that he in, in some way devised a plan for a man that wasn't, was not God-centered, was not, that he, he was devoid of anything to do uh, with that. But yet, um, he was, God wasn't devoid of him. Uh, and he had a plan for him. So, it, it, you know, there, there's ways we soothe our questions by hope uh, and faith, uh, and that combination is a pretty powerful one. As we look at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and unfortunately the church, because of the influence of uh, Constantine in 325 A.D. and the letter from Eusebius, uh, recording the changing of the Sabbath and the changing of Passover to Easter. We don't talk about the life, death, and resurrection. We talk about the life and the resurrection. Uh, we kind of skip over the full Passover scenario, the four days of inspection, uh, the selection of the lamb, the whole process that it occurred from Palm Sunday, which was the 10th of Nisan to the 14th of Nisan, exactly the way it was laid out 
in the examination of Exodus chapter 12. The church is unfamiliar with the whole concept because they've been cheated, they've been robbed from it. They don't understand it because they're just not taught that way. It's Easter, it's the resurrection, it's only the resurrection. So there was this time uh, and the timing of this resurrection of Jesus on the Feast of First Fruits as described in Leviticus 23. So there's a series of specific events that he had to, Matthew 5, 17. I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. Had to be check marks in these boxes that said fulfilled, 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 exactly as it was prophesied. And that's why the New Testament wasn't there, so that you had to go by the 613, very specific, and many of it had to do with the preparation of the sacrifice. And so how he was prepared uh, was extremely important. Now we come to his death and the believer, the Jewish believer, Joseph of Arimathea, offers up his new, unused. This is very significant because as a Jewish perspective, uh, a new tomb was very important. This was the reason why Abraham bought the cave of Machpelah. It had never been used. And it was very important. So if for the patriarch Abraham to have a burial place for his wife and for the patriarchs, uh, Jesus certainly as the Messiah should have as great a gift as an unused because the process was as you would place the body into a, a tomb, a cave. A year later, as the body had decayed, you would gather the bones together, put them into a bone box, an ossuary, and then you would reuse it or put family members. They would stack them, not on top of each other, but there were sections to it. This was an unused, and, and, and I believe that the Jewish heart was is that if it was good enough for the patriarch, it, it certainly my Messiah should have the benefit of this. And the wrapping of the body, we consider the prayer shawl, the tallit, the garment of four corners uh, with the fringe from number 16 in Jewish tradition is what you are buried with, that is the burial cloth. There are counterfeits out there. The Masons use the Masonic apron to bury. Uh, it has its foundation in scripture, but then it, like everything that there's an authentic, there's going to be a counterfeit. So now we come to this linen, flax linen piece of material that surfaces. And it looks like an old sepia photograph from the original days of sepia photographs and it's an impression left on a cloth. Donna, the Shroud of Turin. Oh, yeah, the very first question is, is it a photograph? Well, the way that we can immediately negate that is that the only photographic kind of technology that we would have had in the ancient world would have been an extremely long exposure. So long that the body would have decayed in the middle of that exposure and the the definite line of this image would have been blurred so that's the first question it's not it's it's not a photo um there has been i mean we can send a man to the moon we can biologically integrate human and machine we can do we can do so much technology today that blows our minds when we actually look at what technology we have and yet that particular piece of linen cannot be explained. In any scientific methodologies we've placed against it, it cannot be explained. That just by itself, that one fact that we can't explain it is a good enough reason to suggest that there might be a supernatural explanation. Now I find one very weak and kind of desperate response is no, I'm not going to believe that it has anything to do with Jesus Christ. Oh, but I will believe it. It's, it, it's alien technology. Right. You're going to put your faith somewhere. You know, be open-minded to the fact that what it's telling us, what it's telling us by itself, by its own voice, by its own testimony of the image, and the the 
unfathomable way that that image was created is that it might actually be the burial cloth of Christ. Now, you, me, Ali, Josh, nobody would hang their faith on that like the hat rack. If it turned out tomorrow that it was debunked, we're not going to say, oh, no, we don't believe in Jesus anymore. But the idea is that there is something so peculiar about this. Forensically, it can't be explained. If, if, if it had been a glue, a pigment, or a dye, those, first of all, any, any glues would have trapped environmental contaminants or pollen underneath it at the time of its application. Any dyes or uh, pigments, those would have been changed in uh, the fire of 1532. Um, the scorching method that we have today, it's the most convincing method of reproducing the cloth where people will create kind of like a, a, a laying man and they heat him, like a metal laying man, and they heat him and they lay cloth over it and they kind of press it. It's a pressing scorch technique. It creates the outlineless shroud, just like we see it now. And it's the most convincing thing, but when put under ultraviolet lights, we see that the fabric, that the actual fibers of the linen have been scorched and in turn bright orange under certain kind of ultraviolet uh, examination. There's just, and, and then of course, there's also the argument well, that we've found uh, red ochre on the cloth. We have certainly found red ochre and people say, well, that explains it. It was painted in red ochre. Not exactly. There is not even close to the amount of red ochre in one square, in, in the entire cloth that could count for one square inch of that fabric. Now, why we would, you know, why we would have it on there to begin with, that's explained because back in uh, the days when that was a venerated image, I mean, priests held that cloth all the time and waved it around and, you know, had these holy, uh, you know, kind of parades through these towns, and, and they held it all the time, putting environmental contaminants on the outside, which, by the way, is a major reason for why the radiocarbon dating is incorrect. But one of the practices to um, create a, a, uh, a known painting of the image so that if I wanted to take that home to my hometown, I can say I stood in the same room as the actual burial cloth of Christ, I reproduced the image in my own red ochre, in order to convey and transfer the blessing from the shroud to this painting that I've created so that we can have a venerable image in my hometown, you'd have to lay my painting face to face against the shroud. Um, that's not even to account the fact that if I'm just a really clumsy artist and I've got my red ochre over here and I'm just mixing it like this and crazy in the same room as the shroud. Yes, there are contaminants on the shroud. There's also pollen on the shroud that dates to far before 1260 AD, which is the earliest dating uh, known in the uh, radiocarbon dating. There's also the fact that we can debunk the radiocarbon dating itself in that, like I said a, min a minute ago, radiocarbon dating is very accurate. Now, the shroudy crowd that really wants to prove that ra radiocarbon dating is inaccurate, there have been times where that's the case. I think that it, I think that that can, that can be related to um, errors made in the process um but really it's very 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 accurate kind of information so we should stop trying to prove that the radiocarbon dating is wrong and consider what error might have taken place in the radiocarbon dating in this instance and there's two major ones first of all that cloth was contaminated it was handled it was contaminated by environmental contaminants finger oils priests bishops it had had the, the poker holes in the cloth, which is when an incense had been sp spilled on it. So many things that, and of course there's the fire in, in 1532 that could also arrange some of the fibers on the cloth in a way that was would be unpredictable, all of those things. But the main thing is the corner that they took that, cloth, the, the, that sample from when they did the radiocarbon dating. It, it has been proven that the corner they took was the same raised cloth that was taken back in the 70s. And both times they've taken from an ancient reparation, an area where because of um, uh, the, the fires that had happened, they had gone in there and they had had that area patched. That cloth that was uh, tested does not have the same herringbone weave 
as the rest of the Shroud of Turin. It's also been tested to be yellow cotton with fibers that are red and blue, not present anywhere else on the entire shroud. So the sample that they took wasn't even linen. This cloth can't be explained. It just cannot be explained. Now what can be explained in a very fascinating way, the sedarium, the face cloth um, of Christ. Now what happened, okay, in, in the times of, of, of Christ, when somebody in a, a Jewish family passed away, the first thing that would happen, the minute that they passed, or in the case of Christ, if they're raised up off the ground, the minute you can reach their body, their face would be covered as a sign of respect. Then once that body can be carried to a shroud, it would be placed in a shroud, a burial shroud would go up over like this, like a boomerang up and over, over and around the body. And that's the same shape and everything we get on the Shroud of Turin. The, the face cloth, it does not have that same resurrection image that the Shroud carries. And a lot of people say, well, if it's really the, the burial cloth of Christ, why isn't the image also on the face cloth? And the reason why is because the minute that the body is placed in the burial tomb, again, for, for a million reasons, the sake of comfort, comfort of, the, of the deceased and so on, the face cloth would be removed. Now, this would also happen during the uh, washing and the pe preparation of the, of the burial body, which, of course, is the reason why we have so much bleeding on the shroud, is because while he would have been up on the cross, there would have been um, winds blowing sand everywhere, and he would have come down in a position where the only respectable way to lay him to rest is to wash the body. And that was also uh, an ancient rite that they did. So they, they followed all of the burial methods, reawakened all of the injuries to his body. The injuries to his body, by the way, forensically identical to what the um, Gospels account to be for the injuries that he took. But then when they took that uh, face cloth off of him, the, the scripture says that it's laid aside in the tomb. They took it, they folded it with respect, and they laid it aside. Now, whatever event created the image, and people who are, are faithful shroud followers will believe most often that that was the resurrection event, when Jesus rose himself from the dead, that something occurred scientifically, metaphysically, spiritually, to that cloth to create that image. The face cloth was sitting next to it, so it didn't happen. It, it wasn't a part of that process. However, the blood stains um, match identically. The blood, the areas of the blood on the face match identically to the shroud. Also, we can trace, regardless of the radiocarbon dating for the Shroud of Turin, we can trace the face cloth as far back as 570 AD in Jerusalem, meaning that if you can lay them side by side and forensically match the blood stains and the blood type to the same death event and we have and we can and we have already done this then we can at least say that the the shroud of turin would be in jerusalem as old as 570 a.d uh so so that's that's what i'm saying i mean we can look at radiocarbon dating all day and try to debunk it and say it's a, it, it's unreasonable or that it's unreliable but even if all of those arguments can't be made, the one that can be made is that there is certainly a flaw in the radiocarbon dating, and we can certainly to carry the cloth back further than, than, than a lot of things can be taken. But I mean, not to just go on and on, but there's a lot of evidence, like the tri-dimensional findings, just as one mere example. If I took a picture of your face right now, uh, Eric, and I had it tri-dimensionally examined, it might show that your face is 3D, but your nose concaves backwards. Right. On the image of the Shroud of Turin, every si we can't even get a real photograph of a real person today to show up tridimensionally perfect in a 3D image rendered event. But that Shroud of Turin, every single contour of the, the, the body, front and back, it lies perfectly in, in, in a tridimensional analysis. Donna, let me give you um, what jumped out at me as, as I read all this and, and 
uh, overwhelmed by the detail and, and really pulled into it. But something very unique in the Jewish world was his weight. Now, why would this be important? At approximately 165 to 175 pound, five foot nine, five foot ten. That's that's my size. Jewish people are not. We're not basketball players. Okay, we're not real tall people. You don't find too tall Horowitz or Magic Cohen playing for the NBA. But when we take a look at the weight of the cross that Jesus had to carry, he had to have a certain physical stature to be able to carry it. We see the identical picture in Genesis 22. It's the identical events. Both Isaac and Jesus carried the wood for their offering up the hill. Why is that significant? Well, because to cook something, the ratio of fire to body weight to cook something is one pound of charcoal for one pound or one pound of wood for one pound of food that you're cooking. To sacrifice something, it's double that. In order for someone to carry a 300 pound weight up a hill, you have to be of the physical stature of at least 165 to 175 pounds of lean muscle mass to be able to carry the amount of wood. Both Isaac and Jesus, based on our dating of the birth of Isaac, how old he was, he was somewhere between 30 and 33 years old, the same age. The size he was, was approximately 165 to 175 pounds in order to be able to carry the wood, the two donkeys. Remember, they, they took the wood and Isaac carried the wood. How was he able to carry such a weight? He had to be of a certain stature. And so when I looked at the parallels, and the, that's what jumped out at me, was the physical mm -hmm. composition and the physical composition of what we study rabbinically as Isaac because we see there's 15 parallels between what was the ram caught in the thicket wearing on his head? A thicket is a crown, is a thorn bush. He was wearing a crown of thorns. I mean, there's, there's the will, uh, they're only, the only begotten son. Take your son, your only son who you love. Both did the will of their father. Both left two witnesses behind that didn't see what happened. Both carried their wood up the hill for their offering. So when I looked at this, that was the statistic. Now, odd that I would hone in on that, but I've got to find the biblical link to something that tells me what loving father would ever sacrifice his son. I have to have that introduction in Jewish theology to be able to accept God sacrificing his son. I have to have the precedent set somewhere in the Torah for this to occur, right. for me to even believe that God would sacrifice his son and his only son whom he loved. And they were the same size based on the dimensions given, extrapolation. Wow. This was what for me as a Jew, as a rabbi, mm -hmm. in looking at the Hebrew and looking at the, at, at, at the, the, the resources we have to extrapolate and determine how much that cross piece, the piece that Jesus carried, how big he had to be to carry that kind of weight. And we believe that the weight of the cross was identical to the weight of the amount of wood that Isaac carried for his sacrifice up the hill. This was the parallels as we look at all this. This was what jumped out at me of all the carbon dating and all those other things. The skeletal structure, the physical size and his projected weight was what did it for me. Well, another another peculiar thing is, you know, assuming that it was a forger, not only would they have had to have been able to conduct all of those forensic perfections right. that we find, they would have also had to have been able to accomplish what you just said about the size and weight of Jesus Christ, and they would have also have had to have given him Semitic facial features, which they did. We've been talking with Donna Howell and Ali Anderson Henson in this two-part, two-hour special on Afterlife. We had Josh Peck on for the first hour. We're going to merge these two together to give you, the audience, a special two-hour 
a one-time special that we're going to put up on YouTube where you can hear the entire dialogue from Josh and from Allie and from Donna. The book is called Afterlife, Near-Death Experiences, Neuroscience, Quantum Physics, and the Increasing Evidence for Life After Death. I am blown away by this. It was, we could have done three hours. There's just so much to explore here. Uh, hats off to uh, Tom Horn and the entire team at Defender, you, Ali, all of you. Uh, extraordinary piece of work that I uh, highly recommend. Visit IgnitingAnation.com, click on any one of those names, Josh Peck, Ali Anderson Henson, or Donna Howell. It'll take you right to a link. It says, love the interview, buy the book. Click right there, it'll take you right to a link. Donna. Allie, so great to see you again. Always want to hear from you on any new release. You're a fabulous guest, and we just uh, think the world of the entire Skywatch and Defender team. God bless you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs>